Good evening, everyone who is on our Zoom call tonight. Uh, my name is Nicholas Elliott. I'm one of the members of Itpadaji's Youth Committee Executive Body. And um, welcome to another episode of our weekly uh, session called Spill the Facts. If you notice, Ter Terence and I have our, our, our cups. We're, <laughs> we're trying to spill some facts and hopefully we can get to the bottom of, of some issues. Yeah. So I'd like to introduce someone who is a Guyanese author, poet, medical doctor, and most importantly, a young person among us, right? He grew up in the countryside of Guyana and that offered him a, a slightly different perspective on what life in Guyana is. All right, so resilience and self-determination enabled him to become the man he is today and to achieve the things that he has achieved thus far. All right, so, to achieve these things, he had to go through quite a few obstacles, meander the currents of poverty and failure. And for him, the goal of becoming a medical doctor was always his childhood dream. 24 years later, he not only succeeded in that goal, but uses the experiences and lessons he's learned along the way. That's up until the point of graduation, of course. He's a bit older than that now. Yeah, but using the lessons <laughs> that you've learned along the way to, um, to inspire, motivate, and help young persons who he might encounter. So most certainly, um, having published this book, he has a wealth of knowledge that he can share with us. So this evening, the Apatogy Youth Committee and myself, we would like to ask you to join with us in welcoming Dr. Terence Isaacs on our show. <laughs> Ah, uh, good evening, good evening, good evening, good night, good night. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for that introduction. I feel special there a little bit. Um, thanks for having me. Um, uh, when when I was reached out to to be a part of the show, I was very excited because it got gave me an opportunity to really have a conversation about something I'm very. Um, uh, something that's very close to my heart. So uh, I'm looking forward to how tonight's gonna go. Most certainly. Yeah. All right, so um, I'd like to start by asking you um, a question that's probably in everyone's mind. At 20, yeah. how many of a years old you are right now? 30, what? 30. 30? Yeah. Oh my. Right, sorry. What inspired you to, to write a book? Hmm. Well, to be honest, the truth is I've, I've always wanted to, to write a book. So it's, it's, not, it's nothing new for me writing a book, but more specifically what inspired me to write this book was about two years ago. So when I turned 28, uh, I got this idea of sharing 28 life lessons that I would have learned in my 28 years of living. And the plan was to do it over 28 days. But one of my character flaws, if you want to call that, is that I'm a chronic procrastinator. So I never quite got through writing those 28 life lessons, which were just some Facebook posts I was making all the time in that time period. So um, after talking with a friend of mine, Camille, who was um, actually about to write uh, her first anthology last year, I was like, wait, I actually do have some material. So um, I should definitely make some good use of that. Uh, adding to that, the fact that a lot of my friends, a lot of people I would have been talking to, a lot of conversations that I've seen on Facebook, a lot of the things that are in the book made it more relevant why I needed right. to complete to that book in that point in time. In the introduction, I mentioned that you meandered some of these currents of poverty, of, of hardship. And so can you tell us a bit about where are you from? Give us a background about yourself. So now that we know you had this inspiration, but who is Terence Isaacs? All right, tell us ah. a bit about where are you from? Some of the things, some of the experiences you had growing up. Um, you said that you had these 28 um, ideas that you wanted to bring forward. Yeah. 28 lessons in 28 days, but yeah. what even inspired the 28 lessons in, in 28 days? Okay. Um, so... I grew up um, on the east coast of Demerara. 
I was actually born in Melanie. So I was born in Melanie in the East Coast of Demerara, but then I moved um, at a very young age with my siblings to Victoria Village, where I spent most of my childhood with my grandmother. And um, myself, my two siblings at the time, my grandmother, an aunt, two uncles, and then a cousin, all lived in a house that was pretty much the size of a master bedroom. So um, for most parts of that time, when we first uh, grew up, when I was growing up there, um, running water wasn't a thing, electricity wasn't a thing, inside toilet or bath wasn't a thing. So um, uh, it, those were my humble beginnings. And right. uh, it, it took meandering through poverty to say, hey, education is the thing that I'm going to use to make sure that I do not remain in this place and that I elevate myself to where I'm actually at, I am now. So I think um, those that's the beginning of how things came about. And from since then, dealing with not having enough finances, uh, not having to not having the things that you need to have, et cetera, has helped to shape my perspective and shape my life to the person and the man I am today and how I'm uh, understanding how life should be, how life can be if you put your mind towards making things better. If I get what you're saying, you're saying that you, you went through these experiences and then you decided within yourself that, hey, I'm going to use my education, my knowledge to lift myself and bring my family from point A to point B. Exactly. I think, I think at the end of the day, getting yourself, particularly if you've come through, if you've grown up in such an environment, getting yourself from point A to point B. Point B is becoming successful. Point B is becoming the person that can help others. Point B is lifting yourself out of poverty. And I think that's something that everybody should always aim to do. Certainly. All right. And um, for persons who may be following you on, on Instagram or Facebook, they would know that you, you're an avid poet. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and even, even your book, you opened with um, one of the pieces that, that you attend yourself. So yes, I, yes, I, yes. I can invite you to just um, go through that piece with us, if you can. Okay, no problem. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that now. So the piece is actually called um, The Keys to Success. And the inspiration for this piece was actually uh, last year, two of my colleagues were actually going off to do their residency. And um, one of the going away things we did was to have us like kind of like a get together for them. And this is one of the pieces I wrote for them, but I adapted it for the book because I think it's very important and it speaks to what the book aims to, to do. And it's pretty much, uh, the, the aim is, is basically to implore others to, you know, use themselves to get the keys or the, they are the keys in essence to succeed in in this day and age so i will begin thank you <laughs> when i think of the word success i envision a room with a locked safe you see in my mind locks and safes are synonymous with protection so I guess that's why I keep the things closest to me locked away in a safe place, taking care of what I allow close to their embrace and on this journey called life. You have to be careful with where your path leads you, whether it's down the road to failure or up a hill to success. Now, when I think of the word keys, all I see are endless opportunities dangling in front of me, declaring that my future will be legendary. And then I heard them say that the keys to success will open doors for you, that they will catapult your life into galaxies where dreams become reality. But beware that on the other side, failure awaits your call beckoning for you to fall, threatening to leave you with wounds and scars. So I guess that's why they say you should always aim for the stars because even fallen stars grant us wishes. And though stars don't sing too late, 
they provide a shimmer of hope that even at our darkest hour, we will still find ways to cope. And like keyholes, they deliver an aperture for you to unlock your true potential. In dreams, they are an apparition for new experiences, omens for discovery and knowledge of self spiritually. But physically, they say that your hard work will pay off in the end, but the keys to success are not hard work, but Art work, you must love what you do and in terms do what you love and things work out best for those who make the best of how things work out. They say that if you knock, that the door will open and if you search, then, then you will find. But what matters most are those that don't mind because it's mind over matter. So those who mind won't matter in the end. They say that self-confidence is the key to success. So you must keep believing in yourself, yet you can't always lean on your own understanding because pride begets a plummet. And the secret to life is never what you can get from it, but in how many lives you can change. And I wish you nothing but the best. And in all things that you do, that you will never settle for less because when I think of the word success, I still see a a room with a locked safe. But when I think of the word keys, all I see is you opening the doors to all that you can ever be. Wow. That 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 is profound. That that's deep man. <laughs> that thank you. That's all I can say. Thank you. <laughs> That, that's a lesson that's that's a motivation you brought us to your life through that that piece of art there so oh, thank you I must say thank you for for inviting us thank you for breaking down a few walls so you can share that that piece with us another problem all right. Thank you so much, man. all right so um what i can say is that earlier on you told us where you grew up i don't don't repeat it i won't i won't i won't Thank you. So you told us where you grew up. Um, so for any of the participants that are that have been with us from the beginning, if you can tell us where Dr. Isaacs was born and where he grew up, the village where he grew up, not where he was born, sorry, where he grew up, right? He mentioned two villages. One where he was born and one where he grew up. Right, Terence, we did that, right? Yes, yes, we definitely did. We definitely right. did. So the first person to message in the group chat right here on Zoom to tell us where Dr. Isaacs grew up gets right. And so here we have a winner of our first giveaway prize. Mm. Um, they're, actually, not waste, they're not they, wasting any they, time. Come on, you can tell us which one is which. <laughs> the first person to tell us the village that he grew up right so here we go um i have a trusty assistant who will document their name can you please send us um your email so we can send that ebook to you congratulations to that person i really do hope that they enjoy reading the book and it, it does inspire them to become their best self yeah, I'm certain they might because when I was reading it, it, it felt like it felt like a conversation, you know, it, the, the style of writing. It, it was this sort of, hey, man, this it, it, feel, it felt real. It felt like it felt like the Terrence, somebody might meet on the corner and, and just sit down and who are you in a tight gap and giving uh. you some some good lessons <laughs> so. and you see that was that was the actual aim of it that you know it was supposed to be a conversational kind of a book you know that anybody reading say hey i can relate to this person and the whole point of it is to be relatable so to help persons to actually avoid certain pitfalls right so when you say some persons who were the persons you had in mind when when you were i mean it says 30 lessons before 30 so it's <laughs> those under 30 but <laughs> there are a lot of people under 30 so did you have a specific um target audience and you know, persons you grew up with were you trying to motivate them or persons you went to school with 
who who did you have in mind when when you said there are two lessons to learn? Yes, yeah, so um, I, I th when I said thirty lessons to learn before thirteen thirty, the person that came to mind initially was myself. Oh wow! It was it was it was me going back to myself ten years ago, me going back to myself five years ago, me going back to myself even a year ago, and even before then, and saying, "Hey, Terence, these lessons that you have learned." If you had learned them a little bit earlier, your life in terms of decisions you would have made, et cetera, would have been vastly different. And you wouldn't have to on, uh, go through certain things if you learned these lessons before. So in essence, the lessons is for any young adult, anyone under 30, even persons over 30 who may not have learned those lessons as well by as, as now. It's, it's for anybody really, but predominantly for the young person who is going through school, who's going to university, who has to juggle work, school, who has to juggle relationships, work, school, family. In essence, it's for everybody who can basically understand that, hey, for us to succeed, particularly persons like myself who came from poverty. For us to succeed, there's certain steps we need to take, there's certain things we need to avoid. And the, the earlier we can avoid those things, the earlier we can take those steps towards attaining our goals, the better or the, the quicker we can get towards succeeding. So in essence, it's for the young person who wants to succeed and wants to have a cheat sheet to success. So in essence, I like to call it a cheat sheet to success because in essence, a lot of times we hear people say you can live vicariously through someone. It gives you an opportunity to live vicariously through my experiences while avoiding the pitfalls that I actually found myself in throughout life. Right. And something you highlighted while, while going through that is that um, it's for persons who are working, who have relationships. So clearly, while you were writing this book, you, you weren't saying, hey, let me just write this idealistic um, set of information. You know, you recognize that, that people are in situations and they're dealing with a lot of things, yeah. right? So, I, I mean, when you were writing this book, you were employed, you were working as a doctor full-time. Yes, 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 I was. How did working full-time, having other personal relationships affect your writing this book and what were some of the challenges you faced while writing the book? So... Um, first and foremost, the most important thing to, to, to um, address is the fact that I started writing this book last year, August, and last year, August was the time that I actually moved to where I'm currently at now, which is the UK. So I moved to the UK last year, August. So I recently moved. I started a new job and the learning curve for that job was extremely steep. Um, so it's in a completely different environment, in a completely different working uh, environment as well. So um, my days were very long and the time that I had to write the book was mainly in the weekends. And added to that, I have, as I mentioned before, I am a chronic procrastinator and um, I am my biggest critic. So those things compounded together really did create a lot of pressure in terms of how quickly I was able to complete the book. I initially wanted to finish the book for my 30th birthday, which was last October. And clearly that wasn't, that didn't happen. So um, it was very challenging writing the book, um, juggling work, juggling um, my poetry, juggling relationships, juggling time for myself, it was very challenging. But what helped me along the way was supportive family, both relatives, blood relatives and non-blood relatives, as well as my goal. My goal was to complete the book. And um, of course, that's one of the other things I talked about in the book, um, finishing what you start. So that were the things that kept me going and allowed me to overcome the challenges. So I think setting a goal and saying, hey, this is what I want to achieve, in spite of whatever detours you may take, it still allows you to accomplish those goals. All right. And 
even after writing that book, even after overcoming those obstacles during the writing process, I'm sure you had some other obstacles afterwards, like getting a publisher and, and getting someone to review your book. Um, can you highlight how you might have overcome those? So uh, again, I, I relied a lot. To, I, I had to do a lot of self, a lot of research. So uh, fortunately for me, you can self-publish. So I am a self-published author. Um, I had to uh, get someone to edit my book to create a cover, et cetera. So that was a little tedious and very strenuous. But uh, I had persons that you know I know who directed me in the right direction. Um, the first time I sent my book to the editor, they said that, you know, hey, you need to, you know, add some things to this, make it a little more personal. So I had to go back to the drawing board, be more vulnerable, et cetera. So I think the entire process of going from thought to keyboards, to editing, to formatting, to publishing, it can be very frustrating and a lot of times I was like, do I really want to write this book at the end of the day? But again, coming back to what my goal was, that's what helped me to say, hey, Terrence, you still need to stay focused. You still need to complete the task that you actually had set up for yourself. So, I mean, in the end, I mean, it's still a journey. Uh, I think things have just started. So writing the book is just half of it. Getting the message out there to as many people that I can help, I think that's 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 going to be a hard part as well. So, it's still some a ways to go. And uh, thank you guys very much for this opportunity as well to um, get the message out there. Sure, it's been no problem. So, after all these challenges, you came up with a book, and you decided that the, decided that the title should be "You Are Your Biggest Critic." Yes, yes, yes. Very, very provocative. Very yes. provocative. For two reasons. As I mentioned earlier, I am my biggest critic. People have accused me of being one of the most critical persons that they know, that I'm always criticizing somebody about something they're doing, etc. But a lot of people don't know that the criticism that I may give to other people, I give myself probably 10 times more than that. So I'm constantly critiquing every aspect of my life. I critique what I eat, how I dress, how I look, what I say, how I respond to a situation. Um, and it can be very, very frustrating. It can leave you very depressed. It can leave you very consumed at the end of the day, constantly having these, like I like to call it mental trials, where you put yourself you know, on trial and your thoughts are the judge, jury and prosecutor. So when I came up, when I was thinking of the title, it's also a chapter in the book, You Are Your Biggest Critic. I thought about myself being the biggest critic to myself that I am. And I also think about the times that a lot of the times we don't go about and do things that we want to or we need to because it's not because people are criticizing us. It's because we're criticizing ourselves to the point that it stops us from acting. So that, that was the rationale behind the title that, hey, we all need to stop being our biggest critic. And the only way we can realize we can do that is if we first realize that, hey, we are our biggest critic. Right. And I think that's, that, that's very profound. And it's in fact uh, a chapter in the book as you highlighted, but, um, it's not the first chapter. No, it's not. That was the surprising bit where when I when I when I scrolled, I was like, hmm, okay. So the first chapter you you said um, is that you will fail. That that was quite the shocker, you know. You're scrolling. I've, I've read the foreword. I'm, I'm going, and here I am with the substance. And then I read, I read, and and I'm at, you will fail. And I'm like, hmm, right. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, it seems a bit gloom and doom way to start off the book, but I, I think it was the perfect way to start the book off to get that out of the way, because particularly as, as I mentioned before, education is a thing that I use to lift myself out of poverty. 
as somebody who relies significantly on education, and I think a lot in the Caribbean society, there's a lot of pressure on young people, whether in secondary school, whether in primary school, whether at university, to succeed, to always be at the top of your game. And while for some of us, we can handle that well, for other people, they cannot. But the downside, the other side of that is that for persons who are not accustomed to failing, particularly in academia, when it does happen, it sends them on a downward spiral that can have some detrimental effects. So one of the things for me I had to learn was that you will fail. And this took me throughout secondary school, throughout medical school, internship to realize that, hey, Terrence, you, you will fail. <laughs> And I think one of the important things was that during my internship, I actually failed a rotation. And that was a very big, big thing for me because of course we all have failed what well, most people would have failed a minor test throughout school that doesn't really account for much, but something as significant as an internship in medicine, which can potentially affect your entire medical career. That was significant for me and the spill off from it was um, I was very upset I was lashing out to the person I was an uh, emotional turmoil I was not handling it well because this was the first time that I actually feel something academically in that regard and I didn't handle it well initially but fortunately mm -hmm. I learned that once you have a supportive system and once you learn how to fail forward, which is something else I spoke about in the book, Failing Forward, then failures are just stepping stones. They're not the end. They're just stepping stones towards becoming your best self or the person you're meant to be. All right. All right. So um, it's just about 7.30. So it's time for our second giveaway. Uh, All right. Let's go. Let's go. Go oh, right. So, um, Terence mentioned the the name. Um, the book is "You Are Your Biggest Critic." Right. So, the first person I hear, I see here, Shanetta typed. Um, answers for the questions can be sent in the comments. It may be read faster here. All right. So, Shanetta and Elsie, can you please be on standby to read those comments for me? All right. So, the question is, why did Terence say? that you are, in fact, your biggest critic. And your time starts around now. Okay, okay. so to give the first response, should I read her response? Just a second. Any other responses? So we had um, 30 seconds to think about that. <laughs> uh, can Shanetta please help us with some of our responses to, to see um, what we've had so far and to know who's our lucky contestant? Okay, so the first response we have is from Keisha Mercuria. She said, because you are always criticizing yourself. The next response we have is from Anna Charles. Something's echoing, Shanetta, sorry. Yes, I fixed it. So the next comment that we have is from Anna Charles. And she said that it's because we tend to criticize and downplay our own self. Ms. Tafford said, because a lot of the times you are subject to critical thoughts that consume you, you often act as judge, prosecutor, and jury of your life. Mm -hmm. so, Karen, tell us. <laughs> Which one do you think um, 
totally got the essence of, of, of what you were trying to communicate to us. I think I think I like all three of them. It's just the unfortunate thing I have to choose one of them. I, I think the last one um, probably got the full essence, I'll say. All right. All right. So um, Shanti, can you please help us to make a note of that one? And Miss Stafford, can you please um message Miss Shanetta in a private message with your email? And we'll be able to send you our your your free ebook um, as soon as we get that. All right. So Terence, you were telling us about your first chapter, and that is that you will fail. And your second chapter is to believe in yourself. And many times the things that happen to us are surprisingly not because of our own action, but oftentimes our inaction. Mm. So um, can you please highlight a bit and why you think these were the two most important things to mention before actually telling us that we are our biggest critic? I think um, talking about failure was important because you need, you need to understand that you're going to fail. Self-belief is one of the most important things, or like I say, it's very par it's, it's paramount in, in, in our lives. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I struggled with growing up was that um, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't believe that I can actually become a doctor. For, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, yes, I know finances was a very difficult thing, uh, hard to come by for my family. And um, even up until finishing medical um, secondary school, I was still worried about how am I going to be able to fund um, medical school. So mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't believe that I can actually succeed in that regard and becoming a doctor, as well as science subjects, particularly chemistry and physics, were not my favorite at all. And I wasn't grasping them at all. It's universally acknowledged that, that chemistry and physics are, are the bricks. Yeah, yes, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't grasping them at all. So again, I didn't believe that I was gonna pass those subjects. I didn't believe that I was going to complete the, the prerequisites I needed to get into medical school. So I think it was very important to mention second chapter is that you need to believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, then you've literally already set yourself up to fail. And you can't fail forward if you don't believe in yourself because what's going to happen is if you do fail, you'll say, well, this is it. I can't do any better and I, and, or I wouldn't be any better. And I think the importance is self-belief plays the role of saying, hey, though I may fail, I believe to achieve my goal, so I will achieve my goal. So I like to say, particularly in that chapter, one of the things I mentioned was, I can, so I will. But yeah. you can't if you don't first and foremost believe in yourself. Right. And it's important to notice that you actually followed your last chapter, which is to finish what started. <laughs> right. And, and you, in that chapter, you were telling us about um, essentially the same things you told us about earlier, the, the 28, day, 28 lessons in 28 days. And um, you, can, you can tell us a bit about that. Yes. So um, as I mentioned, uh, when you first started talking about what's the inspiration for the book, in the last chapter I talked, which is titled Finish What You Start, Started, um, it goes back to two years ago. Um, where I wanted to write, a, where I started in essence these 28 posts on Facebook, it was literally on Facebook. Um, I was keeping up with it for probably 10 days. Then I start skipping a day. Then I find a couple of days we skipped. Then it was a week and then it was a couple of weeks. And then I was like, well, you know what, forget it. And I actually stopped making those 28 posts. I never actually completed them. I think I got to about 20. And it was just like almost eight to go. So it was almost there. And I stopped. And the same thing with this book. There are many times I was like, you know what? Hey, mm, I've already passed my birthday. You know, I can just, I'll just finish it whenever, if I ever get to it. And those thoughts kept coming back and, the important thing was 
I had to then tell myself, Terrence, hey, you had a goal when you were six that you wanted to become a doctor and you are a doctor now. You had a goal that you wanted to write this book. You need to finish this book because it makes no sense starting something and not finish it because regardless of what you do in life, once you have a goal, once you've began to do, you begin to do something that is going to make your life better. It, it, you need to see that true to completion. And by seeing it true to completion, you not only tick off a box of saying, hey, I've done this, but the reward, the satisfaction that you get from actually completing that task, it can be something minute. And I think this is more specifically for us that are chronic procrastinators. Um, it can be something minute. Once you've completed that task, that's a huge weight off your shoulder. The relief that you feel from doing that is beyond measures. Like right now, the relief I have from completing this book is beyond measures because you get to look back on the journey you've come from and say, hey, look from where I've started and now have meet this finish line. So the thing is sometimes we want that finish line to be instantaneous, but that's not what life is, unfortunately. So it may be a torturous journey, maybe very long, but the aim is to still finish or to always finish whatever you've started. Right. And I think um, what you said, it, it's, it has so much bearing for all of us because sometimes you sit and, and you have an aspiration, you have a goal. And like yourself, you're just inches away from, from actually achieving this goal, you know? Yeah. And then you decide, hey, I am too exhausted. Yeah. Or, I, can't, I, can't, I can't see myself at the end of this. So I'm just yeah. going to go and, and call it a day. Yeah. I think that it's important to recognize the other things that you have completed and the other things that you have done and the other things you have followed through with. So hopefully that is enough to tell you, hey, you've done these things, you can do this other thing, just keep at it. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So those are some of the um the softer titles that mm -hmm. that you had for your chapter, but you had quite a few um quite a few provocative titles that that when you were reading the content you're thinking, huh, is this really a, a book that's gonna gonna help me find myself, you know? Hmm. And that's like the, um like the fifth chapter you said be selfish. And so I had to skip for a bit and, and read like, hey, what's this? So can you expound a bit um, why you're saying to, to be selfish? Because in the chapter you told us, you know, you explored some of your friendships and, and some of the energies that you would have expounded on those, on those friendships. Yeah, so I think uh, in writing that chapter, I think one of the important things I had to look back on was my relationships, whether it be personal relationships, whether it be friendships, whether it be family relationships, um, I had to look back on my relationships and think about instances where I needed to be selfish. Now, we know that people say you should be selfless, mm -hmm. but as I said in the book, I dare say be selfish, particularly there's certain things you need to be selfish with, your time particularly as young people, having to juggle university, having to juggle relationships, having to juggle your own aspirations, you can't have time or you shouldn't have time for people who are not about uplifting and seeing you become the person you're meant to be. So anybody that's trying to take time away from you, that's somebody that you need to say, hey, hold on, this is my time. I'm going to take back that time and I'm going to be selfish with it. So that's one of the important things that I said you need to be selfish with. So in essence, one of the things that I, I remember re, uh, watching this video, and uh, I think her name is Ayana Bazaz, and she was saying, she was, she was having an interview with Oprah, and she was saying that you can't show up with your cup empty. You have to have your cup full until it's running over. And that stuck with me because it makes perfect sense. You can't be selfless without first being selfful, meaning that you can't give until there's nothing left to give. 
And then people, in essence, take all of that away from you because the takers will take. They're not going to stop take. So as a giver, you can't just keep giving. What's going ha- to have happening is that you're going to be completely depleted. So first, you need to make sure that you are full, meaning you're attaining your goals. You're going after things that you need to go after for your benefit, for your blessing, for your success. And then once your cup is full and it starts to run over, that spillover bits of it is what you can definitely give to other people. And that's why I say being selfish actually means first and foremost, being self-full. Right. So I, I think that was what was, that's the rationale behind saying or saying being selfish. And there are other things I've explored in, in, in that chapter as well. Right. And I, th- I think that, that that's an important point to note because you have so many persons who are accustomed to, to giving and, you know, you give. And I think people say one more you want, blood, you know? I think that's one of our colloquial expressions. So I think it's, it, yeah, it, it is important that you recognize that you need to have some sort of self, some, some semblance of self, and then you, you cultivate that, you nurture that, and then you're able to healthily give somebody of yourself. Yeah. I think that's, that's important. Another, another chapter that, that jumped out at me well, was chapter 10, which you entitled Forgive and Remember. Because um, usually the, the people say to forgive and forget, but you tell us to forgive and remember. So um, can you tell us a bit um, about what you meant by that? Oh, oh you're, you're exposing the thing here. Um, you're not going through all of this. <laughs> no, no, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Um, what I meant in terms of we getting into the nitty gritties. Getting into the nitty gritty. Yeah, uh, the, the purpose behind that the title of that chapter as well goes back to relationships. So as I said, it's the void pitfalls that I have found myself in throughout my life. And one of the things I had to, that I struggled with for a long time was forgiveness. And one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is forgiving because we feel that anyone that has hurt us needs to pay. And the best way to pay is to not forgive them. And oftentimes we don't realize that most times these people that may have hurt you or have hurt you are walking around clueless that you are so hurt because they have no clue of of, of the impact that they've had on your life, particularly that you holding on to or withholding forgiveness. The important thing to also know is that forgiveness isn't really for the person that hurt you. Forgiveness is for you to get out of that situation, for you to let go of those toxic, negative emotions you're feeling towards that person. And I talked about my relationships, particularly like for instance, my first real heartbreak, uh, which was about 10 years ago. And um, it, it took me a while to forgive that person. But I had to because the person I was becoming, the person I became for a while, was a very toxic man. And in essence, you can't be toxic to other people and then expect to then play the victim card and say, hey, I am this way because someone else hurt me. That's that's, that's, that's not the right thing to do because you're creating that cycle of hurt people will hurt people. So remembering of forgiveness, the remembering part that I'm saying is that you need to remember that, hey, this happened and be vigilant to not make it, allow it to happen again. So that's why you need to remember. You're remembering to ensure it doesn't happen again. So that's why you need to forgive and that's why you need to remember. So when you forgive this person, Forgiveness can mean that that person stays in your life. It means they don't stay in your life. That's fine. But forgiveness also means that you have to say, hey, I'm not going to hold this against this person anymore. And I'm going to remember this instance so that if I see anything like this in my future, I know exactly that, hey, this is something you need to step back from because this is not helpful to me or for my growth or for my mental well-being at all. So that's why you need to forgive and remember. 
Right. Um, I, I think something that, that you highlighted that, that I want to just dial back on a bit is that you said, well, there are different ways, essentially, to forgive. You can forgive somebody and they can be removed from your life or you can forgive and they can still be in your life. And I think, I think that's something we need to always be cognizant about that, you know, hey, there is no hard and fast rule as to how we are going to forgive or what this process is. It's all, you know, individualized to, to us. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And another, so we're just gonna, we're, we're almost there, you know? <laughs> another one that struck out as well was, was learning to say no. Um, hmm. Why do you think it's important that we learn to say no? I think this ties back in with being selfish. This ties back in with forgiveness. This ties back in with knowing the person that you want to be. So one of the things that I've talked about in the book is I've went through a period of my life where I was a yes man. And it stemmed from a relationship where I felt that if I didn't say yes to any and everything, that that person's going to get whatever they want from someone else. So over time, I became very, in essence, available. So somebody messaged me, I'm there, I'll respond almost instantaneously. I mean, I'm working in that now. And the important thing to note is that sometimes you have to say no to people. And it's easy to say no to somebody that you that's an acquaintance that you don't know that you don't care about but it's very difficult to say no to somebody that you really care about a family member uh, a partner etc and people can then those persons can then use that you're being a yes man or yes woman for their advantage which then means if you're not saying no if you're saying yes to everything you're not giving your time giving yourself time to reach your goals. You're not giving yourself to develop your within yourself. You're not giving yourself to have more autonomy about what you really want to do. Instead, you are in essence going off of the influence of someone else. So saying no gives you an opportunity to say, hey, hold up, this is so far I'm allowing you to, to go. And this is what I am willing to sacrifice, is what I'm willing to compromise, and is what I'm not going to compromise in. And quite frankly, I'm just going to say no to this because at the end of the day, you should never say yes to anything that is going to harm you physically, emotionally, sexually, any of those things you should never say yes to. So saying no helps to improve your health holistically. I guess that ties in with your um your idea that you know hey you should you should be selfish with yourself make sure that you are healthy make sure that you're intact because ultimately if you are unwell then you're not able to offer a proper product exactly exactly yes right all right so um I think we've had quite a bit of questions from me um so earlier on we went through the housekeeping rules as to how we should ask questions. So if any of the other, um, any of the listeners here would like to ask Dr. Isaac a question, you can go ahead. You can ask that question in the comment section and it will be read out loud. Or you can um, raise your hand and you'll be unmuted by the host and allowed to speak. Right, so here we have a question from Mr. Matthew Gall. He is the president of the youth committee, I should point out. Uh, right. And he says that, <clears throat> sorry, there's an aspect about the book about unplugging from social media to maintain our mental health. Can you shed some more light on this theme? Yes, um, as, I, as I said, one of the things that I like about the book is that while writing the book and even after I've published the book, I've noticed that I go on social media and I notice things are going on and I'm like, 
I just wish these persons can just read this book and it'll change your perspective drastically. Most recently, I think, uh, at least in the Guyana perspective, um, one of the things that was happening about like a weekend ago, there was a big social media uproar about some things that was going on in some, some groups in social media. And one of the things that I posted a, a, a snippet from the book about unplugging from social media, particularly in this day and age, I know there's a pandemic, I know there's lots of anxiety, I know that social media is one of the ways that we can express ourselves, um, communicate with each other, etc. But social media why it's a great tool it is also an opportunity or presents an environment for mental health to be further deteriorated and the reason being is that social media first and foremost sells us a lie and that lie is that if you look at the influencers if you look at that it's all about the likes it's all about the comments it's all about you know popularity and Oftentimes people are going through struggles and we don't know because we look into their social media and thinking that that's what's going on. Now, that can be discouraging for other people, especially in this point in time where people may think that, hey, um, I'm not getting true with what I want to do because of the pandemic, but this person's getting true. And then you start to compare yourself to them. And that allows an environment where your mental health starts to deteriorate because it's like, well, oh gosh. What am I doing with my life? And that's an important thing. Why unplugging from social media is important. About four or five years ago, I was very active on social media. I'm commenting in every post and I'm sharing my opinions. Um, I always have an opinion to share and you're getting into arguments and people, you just find that it, it's very time consuming. It can very be very toxic and it gets you very worked up so I had to tell myself hey Terrence this is not healthy you, you you need to give it a break so now I would scroll through Facebook and I would see people commenting and things I don't agree with and I will just let it go and you feel a sense of calm and a sense of peace when you just don't when you realize you don't have to react to everything and social media with the, you know, you can react instantaneously. It, once you realize that you don't have to, you, you don't have to share your views. You don't have to give an input in things. It really does improve your mental health because you have so much peace and it really humbles you and, and helps you to, in essence, like I call it, it teaches you how to shut up because in essence, we, we need to learn to shut up in this day and age. Not everything requires a response. Definitely. And um, I see here, um, Mr. Elio Cameron. I'm not sure how the first name is pronounced, but Mr. Cameron um, did have a question. He raised his hand. So I'm not sure if the host can assist by unmute unmuting his mic and allowing him to speak. Please. Yeah. All right, Mr. Cameron, can you please go ahead with your question? Hello. Okay. So I guess um, I guess he wasn't ready to ask his question. So we have a third question from um, a Mr. David Adams. He actually he actually has two questions, uh, part one and part two, I guess, I suppose. Um, the part one was. Do you have any advice um, for young writers like yourself? And two, how can we get access to your book? Ah, I'll do. I'll do the first one. Um, my 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 <laughs> it seems very simple and straightforward. But my advice would be, just write. Just just write. Just, just start. Just just start. If you've already started, just continue writing. Oftentimes what we write we think and this is why i come back to say you are your biggest critic we think that what we write is absolute trash like for me one of the reasons that i took so long to publish it because i thought what I was writing wasn't going to be sufficient or wasn't going to be important wasn't going to be as you know uh relatable and if I had listened to myself and, and not continue, I wouldn't have published a book. And so far, the reviews I've gotten from persons who've read the book is that 
it is very relatable. It's something that speaks to their own lives and their own experiences, and they can see how it can be very helpful to themselves. So I will say, just write. And the other thing would be is to not listen to the naysayers, because naysayers is going to say, why you want to write? Why you want to be a writer? Why, why you want to publish a book? Just do it. That's what I'll say. Just do it. And surround yourself with people who are going to help you to become a better writer. That's, that's, that, that'll be my advice. In terms of where you can get the book at the moment, it is on Amazon and both the ebook as well as the paperback. Because of pandemic, it's going to be a little difficult to actually get books um, in stores in Guyana, for instance, uh, Barbados, other Caribbean countries. I'm currently trying to uh, figure out the logistics between, behind getting the book actually in Austin's bookstore in Guyana. So uh, just stay in tune with the page. You are your biggest critic for more dates than that. But at present, both the ebook and the uh, paperback is available on Amazon. And the thing is, it is not expensive. So no, it, does, it does not cause an arm and a leg. Yeah. All right. Um, so Mr. Cameron said that he was getting some um, some difficulties with his computer mic. So if we can have him unmuted now, please, and he can then ask his question. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a bit of mic problem. Anyway, uh, Prince, I must applaud you. I mean, it's not every day that you get to see a young person chasing after their dream. And it's it's really refreshing and inspiring to see somebody of, of, of an African descent going out there and chasing after something that they truly desire. Uh, in your book, you, in the second chapter, if I might be wrong, but when you spoke about self-belief and which which was really inspiring. Like we all as youths need to believe totally in ourselves because in a world where everybody's telling that you can't do something, because that's what you're hearing. As much as you would say that your own critic your environment would tend to contribute to that a lot. And then uh, in your last chapter where you spoke about uh, finishing what you started and uh, the feeling you get when you finish that task that you had set out for yourself. And it's, it's, it builds self-trust, in my opinion, and creates that integrity within yourself, that knowing that, okay, I can do this. If I said I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So I must applaud you for using your, uh, your life as an inspiration and a, and a teaching lesson and a guide for, for those who may be struggling uh, in, in this, I would say, uh, dynamic world. Everything is just changing. And, and one thing that you always need to be true to is to yourself. Um, and a second part, this is my first... Uh, spill the facts uh, session with uh, the group. Uh, when I first heard about uh, this youth committee, I, I, I emailed the host uh, because I, I was following um, some developments in as it relates to, I mean, this probably this is not the forum, but I still want to let them know that I emailed them concerning uh, the developments in circulating around Africa and, 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 and this unification. So I don't know if there's a next session that we could add probably talk about spilling facts but more about you know uh, African history and, and cultural awareness to, to young minds because it's very essential to know where you came from because that that's where true strength is you know so again parents I must uh, applaud your book and I will try my best to get my hand on a copy because it, it it's it really inspire a young person to believe in themselves and education is definitely the key so thank you again Thank you. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Thank you so much, Mr. Cameron, for that comment. And... Right. So um, we have next we have a question from uh Keishel. Keishel, um can't remember the last name. Jennings. Keishel Jennings. And just uh, a pointer for Mr. Cameron, you can like our uh, Itpadaji Youth Committee. Uh, Itpadaji, Itpadaji. Uh, let me pull up the actual Facebook page. Itpadaji Youth Movement, Youth Organization. Um, 
I'm not sure if you can see it. Yet. I can't share the screen yet. Right, but if you go on Facebook and you look for Itpadji Youth Movement, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to get more of our information about when our Spill the Fact series are being held. Usually, it's every Thursday at around seven p.m. All right. So our next question is from Marva. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm looking for the, the last name. Marva Langevin, that's, that's the person. So if our host can assist us with unmuting Miss Marva Langevin and she can go ahead with her question for you. Hi, good night. Hi, good night, Miss Langevin. Yes, I was asking um, what does the, your self-care routine look like to Terrence? Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's a very thoughtful question. Um, what does my self-care routine looks like? Uh, for me, I think it, it starts with mindfulness. So the first thing, first thing you need to do is be mindful and practice mindfulness. When I say practice, practice mindfulness, what do I mean? I mean that you have to start think, telling yourself and it, this is where it comes back. It's a serious conversation you have to have with yourself and say, hey, things that I cannot change, I will not worry about. Things I can change, I will try my best to change them. However, if I'm not successful in changing them the way I want, what is the bigger picture? So for me, the first thing is I had to change my perspective on how I view things generally. So prior a lot of things that would upset me don't upset me anymore and the reason being that they don't upset me is because I tell myself hey why am I bothering about something that I have no control over the things I can control I will control then the other thing I do is and, and this is a very important thing I was telling somebody as well you don't have to respond to everybody you can take as much time that you need for your own self whenever you need it once you're able to be able to function effectively, if you need to just sleep for an entire day and that makes you feel refreshed, do that. If you need to take a walk to the park, do that. Whatever activity that brings you comfort, that brings you peace, that's what you need to do. And you don't have to always um, talk to somebody if you don't need to. But at the same time, you must have people that you can reach out to when you need help. So generally what I do is change my mindset. So my mindset is if I can't change it, if it's something beyond my control, then I'm not gonna even bother with it. Because if I stress what's gonna happen, my mental health is gonna be worse. My physical health is gonna deteriorate. And holistically, I'm actually doing worse than I was before whatever happens. Then after I've said that, hey, well, I can't change things, the next thing I be is like I do it is say, well, this is my chill time and I take my chill time. For me, my weekends, because I'm not on work on weekends, is literally time for me and my space. And I just love my space. So it comes back to being comfortable in your skin and being comfortable spending time with yourself. Uh, it may be, be difficult if you live in a home with a lot of people or family, you may be finding it difficult to spend time with yourself because there's always things to do, et cetera. But I will say as much as you possibly can still try to spend time with yourself. I think that's what works for me. All right. So I think that, that, that was a brilliant answer. It, it, it totally, it encapsulated everything you, you, probably want to know about how, when, everything. Um, our next question is from ER, that's their username. Um, if someone is struggling to strike a balance between studying and personal or family issues, how would you encourage them to stay focused? Hmm. I think that's a difficult question because a lot of the times we live by the the notion that um, 
not being okay is a problem. And that's false. It is okay to not be okay sometimes. And this is why I say that first you need to know yourself. So if you know that, hey, you have to study for school, there's some issues going on with your family. And for instance, relationships or finances are being issued. You pick up the things that you can change and the things you can't change. You can't change those. Like you can't help who's your blood relatives, but you can help how much interactions you have with that person. So striking a balance between studying, work, family, what I always say is you first need to say, if you're feeling overwhelmed, admit to yourself that you're overwhelmed. And sometimes it's okay to not be, what's the word? Because sometimes we want to be our own superman, our own superwoman. We want to, you know, rule the world ourselves. But no, it's okay to, once you have people that you can rely on, one, two, be okay with yourself to say, hey, I am not coping and I need to find help. So seeking help, particularly if your mental health is deteriorating, is very important. And I know, particularly in Guyana, that may be a little more difficult, but at least if you have one friend that you can not necessarily tell all your business to, but at least to have a conversation where they can just listen. And I think that goes a, a long way in terms of helping you to, to balance it too. So it's just knowing what you can do knowing what your goals are as well. So everything should come back and tie into what your goals are. So if your goals are to achieve such by such and such time, then you work towards that. However, you must not have rigid goals. So if your goal is to graduate by 25 and you realize you're not grasping a concept, you're failing a course, then that doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means you may need a lot more time. So readjust or realign your goals for your in a, for what's actually happened in your life at that moment in time. So I think, I, ho I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't rattle on too much, but I think that that's a good way to balance, balance them together. It's more like a trial and error. See where you are, try again, reassess, check again. And when you find something that works, then you can you go with that. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. And... Our final question is from um, Denise Henry. Uh, it says, what was the process like trying to get your work published? And she gave an example. Um, who, who did you have proofread it for you? Um, how did you end up choosing a book cover? And the second question was, whose books have inspired you or what words have stuck with you during your self-actualization process? So um, the first part, what was the process like getting the work published? So self-publishing is very tedious because um, everything you're literally doing for yourself. Uh, so that, that was strenuous, but again, it comes back to realizing what your goals are. So um, I had to write my, well, I, I wrote my manuscript myself, then, um, getting someone to proofread, that was another issue because unless you have a lot of money and you want to write a book, it is going to be difficult. So the next best thing was to check to see where you can get someone to proofread your work that isn't going to literally leave you in expense for a long time. So research comes in a very important, a long way. So before writing, you should research a lot in terms of what you want to write, in terms of genre, um, what's your, your target audience, how are you going to go about writing, how are you go about proofreading, et cetera. So then once I've done that, I was then able to find someone online to proofread my work for me that's confidential. And uh, I liked how they proofread my work and edited it. And I used them twice, actually, for my book. And in terms of the book cover, that was my diff most difficult or challenging thing because I had the title, but the artwork, I was like, I have no idea how I want to represent this. So again, is researching and find uh, um, an artist or a graphic designer that can bring what you want to life to something that you can appreciate and 
they are inexpensive ones, persons that you can use that's not gonna, you know, send you bankrupt. Um, whose book have inspired me or what words have stuck with me during my self-actuation process. To be honest, I am not too much of a reader. And the reason being, does it make sense? But the reason being is that med school has completely ruined reading for me. So I, I read, but not as in depth as I did when I was way younger. When I was much younger, I read a lot. And for me, it's more inspirational things. So the thing that inspired me the most is actually not a famous person, not a book, but the interactions I have with people in my life, people that I look up to, people that I admire, and people that look up and admire me, look up to and admire me. So along my process of self-actualization, it's first looking internally. So this is where uh, introspection plays an important role. And that's one of the thing, one of the huge themes throughout the book is that it offers you opportunities, at least 30 large opportunities to introspect, to reflect. So once you can reflect on your life, reflect on the person you've been and then say, hey, I don't like this. I want to improve on that. That helps a long way. Having people in your life that you can relate to, that you've seen personally, that's gone to struggle, that have self-actualized, those persons can also help you to become the person that you're meant to be. So for me, my inspiration really comes from relationships, whether the ones that were bad, the ones that were great, whether personal relationship, whether relationships online that I've seen from people I communicate with, relationships with family, relationship with co-workers, that's what inspires me to become a better person, to, in essence, be the best version of myself. All right. And um, I know that that was quite quite a bit you just said there. But um, are there any other any any other remarks that that you might have? Because um, we're we're winding down on time. So is there anything you have off the top of your head that that you might think is um pertinent that we should know? So what what I'll say is um, and this is not just me trying to plug my book. This is me trying to say hey. I've literally seen conversations with people online. I've seen conversations with my friends, conversations with people that my friends talk to, and they've all said things that jugs my memory to things that I've talked about in the book. And I think it's very important that every young person, young adult who wants to become successful or who is on the path to becoming successful, I think reading this book isn't just another self-help book. It allows you a lot of opportunities to actually take stock of your life, where it is, where you were, and where you want to be, and kind of bring all of those together. So what I'll say is, if you want to actually take that journey, this is a good place to start. If you want to improve your relationships, this is a great place to start. If you want to become your best self, this book is the best place to start, especially in this time where there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to come out of it. What I think we all need is someone relatable that can show you, hey, I've been through this, I've been through that, and you can too. I mean, yes, I will agree, my struggles may not be as serious as other people, but I think it's sufficient enough to let people know, hey, I can learn from this person's struggles in that way. And I'll always say, becoming your best self actually starts with you and no one else can actually help you to become your best self. What other people can do is to guide you, but at the end of the day, it's you who determines if you become your best self or not. All right. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I, I definitely would encourage everyone that, that's watching, you know, you should go and see if you can get a copy of Terence's book. Um, so we have uh, a final giveaway at, at the end. Um, so this one 
is gonna be given away afterwards, right? Uh, so it says that the first person to like the book's promotional page, right? So you need to go like the book's promotional page. The book's page is, you are your biggest critic. So you can go on Facebook, like that page, like Itpadaji's youth group page, right? So you go to Itpadaji Youth Movement on Facebook, you like that page and invite 15 friends to like those pages, you're gonna be your winner. So what you can do when you've finished liking both pages, inviting persons to like the pages, then you go ahead and send that screenshot to Itpadaji's message, message inbox and you'll be the winner. The first person that does it is going to be declared the winner and um, the final recipient of our three grand giveaways <laughs> during tonight's um, interview session. But um, Terence, something that I noticed is that you always ended your book with, um, let's take a selfie. And I know that a selfie is a it's a, te a technology kind of thing, but then you 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 turn selfie into something selfie, like like you look at yourself. So I, I just I wanted to know like what was your thought process? How did you come up with that creative bit of um that that pun there? Yeah. So the let me take a selfie exercise that's in the book that's pretty much at the end of each of the chapters. Uh -huh. The the purpose of that is so the book doesn't become a regular self help book. So most self-help books that people are going to read is just going to say, hey, this is how I got through this, blah, 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 and that's it. But right. it doesn't actually allow the reader to help themselves besides saying, hey, this is how to go through that. A lot of the time we need advice, but most of the time what we really need is to take a stock of ourselves or check ourselves. So the let me take a selfie while it's kind of punning on the whole, you know, let me take a selfie. So... Yeah. When you take a selfie, in essence, what I want you to do is to take a snapshot at your life at the various points and see how that snapshot has influenced the person you are today. And that snapshot can improve how you are and make you a better person. In essence, I want you to reflect. I want you to think about your present, think about your future and see how you can use whatever you've been through, where you're at, to get to your end point. And that's what we want to achieve. That's how we become our best self. That's how we self-actualize. That's how we become successful. And that's how we stop being our biggest critic. Wow. All right, that, 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 was, that was an amazing thought process. But um, I interpreted it a little bit more literally. So, um, oh. <laughs> What I'd like right now for everyone on this call to please turn on your videos so that we can go ahead and take a selfie. Oh my gosh. It's gonna be it's gonna be a screenshot of everyone, all the participants. So if you can please go ahead, turn on your video, and we can uh, have one of our other group members to take a selfie for us. It's it's a sel it's a COVID selfie. No worry. Mm -hmm. And only a few persons have um, taken their cameras off. Mm -hmm. I think most people probably wasn't, wasn't aware that, you know, this is going to be something, so they're probably not prepped for camera. Yeah. We're still waiting. <laughs> All right, so... um. Nancy, can you please go ahead and, and take a, a screen grab of all the participants? I think people are, are, are still turning on their, their cameras. <laughs> Somebody's in the kitchen frying these plantain. It's fine, it's fine. That's all part of the experience, Jim. reached our, our maximum number of persons that will turn on their cameras. All right. 
All right, Terence, Dr. Isaacs. So I think um, I think I, I'd like to thank you so much um, on behalf of Epadogy's Youth Committee for availing yourself to participate in our our spilled fact session. I know we've had quite a bit to to sip on and yes, lot, yes, we have a lot of thought to to ruminate on. So I do hope that um that persons will take the things that you've said into consideration and most importantly that they can get a copy of this book and see a lot of the lessons that are are important to to self-actualization and to becoming the best version of yourself you know these 30 lessons that they need to learn by 30. so on behalf of myself in my personal capacity and in the capacity of a youth committee member thank you so much dr isaacs for your participation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for your organization, Epadogy, to uh, reach out and uh, for allowing me to share something that's there to me with uh, your group as well as the world. So this means a lot to me. And I do hope that I can liaise with you guys in the future for any other discussions you want to have not necessarily about the book, but anything else, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll be very much available and, and, and I'll welcome the opportunity. We'll, we'll hold you to that. All right, so um, the president of the youth committee, um, Mr. Matthew Gall, he has a few words he'd like to say um, before we go ahead and close. Good night, everybody. Hi, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful session. This was one of my favorite sessions tonight i love the um conversation and it's really um heartwarming to see a young uh black man shining so uh thank you everybody for um tuning in tonight but before you go i want to leave a special announcement next week thursday at 7 p.m we'll be having a special uh program uh titled in the, it's an independence celebration. Uh, we're going to be having some cultural performances. We have our junior, Calypso Monarch, Miss Omaya Hall. Uh, Hannah Ben Louis is going to be on the steel pan. And we're going to have uh, spoken words and other uh, exciting cultural performances as we celebrate our independence or 54th independence anniversary. We also want to encourage everyone to wear uh, either a cultural outfit or colors of the national flag because we're going to be giving away prizes to the best dressed person, uh, whoever uh, wears the best cultural outfit or rocks the national colors the best We'll be getting a prize. So we want to make it a full Guyanese night. We're going to be having uh, Dr. Dwayne Edwards, Mr. Sharma Solomon, and Mr. Aubrey Norton is going to be there for a session on our independence and nationhood and our history. And we're going to have our cultural night as well. So invite a friend, invite a family to tune into this program. And Next week, we're going to have a really fun time. So again, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Dr. Isaacs, for tonight. And I want to invite all of our young people to ensure that you tune in next week. We'll be starting at 6.30 next week because uh, the program is going to be a bit uh, longer than the usual program. So we're going to go from 6.30 next week to about 8.30. Will there be food? Uh, <laughs> Pertinent questions, Matthew. Pertinent questions. That's a very good question. Uh, Keisha, we're going to put you in charge of the food section for next week's program. So we want some curry, we want some cook-up, we want some Chinese fried rice if possible. So Keisha, I'm, I'm putting you in charge of that for next week. <laughs> and thank you, every much, thank you very much for everybody for um, coming out tonight. And do enjoy the rest of the evening. Please ensure that you stay safe and adhere to all of the social distancing guidelines and all the health guidelines. So thank you very much again.
All right, Matthew, thank you so much for that. All right, so this has been our episode of Spill the Facts. Um, as Matthew said, tune in next week and for another episode of Spill the Facts with spon sponsored or with the organization of Epadogy's Youth Committee. Um, with us this evening, we've had Dr. Terence Isaacs. He is a Guyanese author, poet, uh, a doctor, um, a young man that has managed to take himself to where he is regardless of all the opposition that has been against him. So thank you very much, Dr. Isaacs, and see you again next week. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Good night.